more of, we're going to be in Exodus chapter 31. Right. What's that? John? What, what, what does it say I'm preaching? I don't think there is a John 31. Let's try Exodus 31. <clears throat> yeah, you're going to spend the rest of the evening looking for John 31. Let's try Exodus 31. I'll give you a second time to play here. I was thinking about those games, and uh, I was thinking, you know, it'd be fun to play those games again. I thought, everything is whisker. I don't know that I can... And then I thought, that's what a cool thing for the next Sam's and Sal's meeting to still <laughs> play a game of whisker. I think I would buy a ticket to see that. We can raise money for our building fund. We can sell tickets for that. Fun stuff. <clears throat> hey, in case you didn't get the, pick up on the announcement from this morning, let me make it again. Everybody listen to me. There will be no adult Bible study Wednesday night. We always cancel during BBS week. I didn't mention that at Bible study last Wednesday night. And I know I'm going to you're going to be like the people, you know, the children of Israel who went out on the Sabbath to gather manna and they were just wandering around wondering, where is it, where is it? So you show up Wednesday night, you know, Trey might let you in with the youth, I don't know. But um, anyway, just be aware of that. All right, Exodus 31, Thir Exodus 31, verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, see, I have called my name Bezalel, the son of Uriah, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and understanding and knowledge and in all manner of workmanship to design artistic works to work in gold and silver and bronze and cutting jewels for setting and carving wood and to work in all manner of workmanship. And I indeed, I have appointed with him Aholiah, Aholiah the son of Ahissamach, of the tribe of Dan, and I have put wisdom in the hearts of all the gifted artisans, that they may make all that I have commanded you. The tabernacle of meeting, the ark of the testimony, and the mercy seat that is on it, and all the furniture of the tabernacle, the table and its utensils, the pure gold lampstand, with all its utensils, the altar of incense, the altar of burnt offering, with all its utensils, and the labor and its base, the garments of ministry, the holy garments for Aaron the priest and the garments of his sons to minister as priest and the anointing oil and the sweet and sweet incense for the holy place according to all that I have commanded you they shall do. Unsung heroes. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father we come to you tonight again Lord and I just ask that you please speak to us. God, I, I pray that you'd please give me the sermon that you want me to preach tonight and the power by your Holy Spirit to, to preach it. Thank you for the opportunity to be here and to stand in your name and proclaim your word tonight, God. I thank you for these that you brought here tonight, Lord. Speak, speak peace to our hearts tonight, Lord. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Unsung heroes. So, Exodus is a really amazing book. Because in it you get to read all about everything that Moses and Aaron did. How, uh, how God through Moses led the children of Israel out of bondage in Egypt. And, and how God miraculously provided uh, bread from the sky and meat to eat and uh, water from the rock. And all this stuff. The Ten Commandments in Mount Sinai and all that stuff. But here's my question that I want us to think about tonight. What about all the things that Moses didn't do? Moses did a whole lot, but Moses was one man. What about all the things that he didn't do? And there's a whole lot of things that people did uh, in the name of the Lord that, that didn't get recorded. And there's a whole lot of things that did get recorded that we don't think that much about. But I want us to take the time tonight and think about the unsung heroes for just a minute. And I, I want us to think in terms of this. God has a job for each of us to do. God didn't call you to just sit and do nothing. He called each of us to a specific work in the kingdom. 
And what God has called me to do, it, I'm front and center of, of it all. I, I mean, it's hard for me to hide. You know, I, we're, I was talking to David before church. I said, man, they got you hit. He said, I like it back here. They're, they're just, David is hiding behind the operation guy like that, you know? It's hard for me to hide. I mean, you know, I, I can't stand behind a piece of cardboard and do, you know, and, and do what God told me to do. It's hard for me to, to do anything other than be front and center and everybody see me and everybody hear me. And, you know, uh, I mean, you're, you're, you're not going to be in church very long without seeing me and knowing who I am and knowing what I do. But God has a job for each of you to do. And, and it's no less important than the job I do or Bill does or whoever may be. And so what we have in, in chapter 31 of, of Exodus is a record of how God used behind the scenes people, behind the scenes guys to accomplish his purpose. Now maybe that's you tonight. Maybe you, you, you always thought, I, I wish I could do something for the Lord, but, but you know, I, I can't preach, and, you know, I'm, I'm not a Sunday school teacher, and, you know, I'm, you know, I'm not going to be one of those guys that, you know, I'm going to be, I, I may not even make the, the list that comes out once a year of here's all your, your leaders, you know. But God has a job for you to do in his church, in his kingdom. And so if that's you and you're a behind the scenes kind of person, then this sermon is kind of for you tonight. We're gonna we're gonna ask ourselves tonight three questions that a servant of God must ask. <coughs> three questions that a servant of God must ask. First is what shall I do? What shall I do? That, is that been your your question? I wish, you know, I want to do something for the Lord, but what shall I do? Well, God has a work specifically for you that nobody else can do but you. Um, in chapter 31 begins by God saying to Moses, I see I have called by name Bezalel, son of Uriah. I've called him by name. This was a job that was specific to Bezalel. No one else. He didn't, he, God didn't go to Moses and say, now Moses, I want you to get together a committee to see about making the, the Temple and the, I mean the tabernacle and the ornaments of the of the tabernacle. You know, appoint a committee. Is it, I heard a preacher say one time, you know what a what a camel is. You know what a camel is? That's a horse put together by a Baptist committee. Uh, so, you know, he didn't say not committees are necessary. I'm not. This isn't about committees. It's about the fact that God has something specific that you can do. That we can't necessarily appoint a committee to handle your job because you have something that God specifically has for you to do. Moses and Aaron couldn't have done these things. But Moses was a great leader. He was a great man of God. He, 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 he accomplished great things. Through, God accomplished through him great things in the nation of Israel. But the things that Bezalel was going to do, Moses couldn't do. Bezalel, we're told, was from the tribe of Judah. Judah was an important tribe. Judah was where the, the, the line of the kings was going to come from. Judah was, was the tribe that King David came from. It was the tribe that all of the successive kings of Judah would come from. Uh, and it was it was the tribe that ultimately the Messiah would come from. But Bezalel wasn't going to be king. Bezalel was never going to sit on the throne. But yet Bezalel had a, a job to do that only he could do. Then we get mention of a, an Ohio, oh, 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 I can't pronounce his name, a holy off. I, I butchered that on. A holy a holy uh, We're going to call him that anyway. A holy uh, uh, He's only now. How many have you ever heard a sermon on a holy uh? you know, Me neither. I mean, I, you know, he's only mentioned here and in the subsequent fulfillment passages where 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 it's recorded that they did all the things God told them to do, and the holy uh was mentioned there. So 
there's not great chapters of the Bible written about a holy ark. But yet he's second in command here. See that? Just because someone doesn't get a lot of notoriety and a lot of press and a lot of things said about them or written about them doesn't mean they're any less important. Holy ark is going to be second in command. He, he's going to be uh, he's going to be the artisan that's going to make all of the uh, the, the furnishings of the tabernacle. And then you get a whole lot of unnamed people. See, it wasn't just Bezalel. It wasn't just Aholiah. It wasn't, it wasn't just these people that made the, the tabernacle and the furnishings of the tabernacle. You get a whole bunch of people that are, are not named that complete the work of, of this to bring it about. They don't get written up in the Bible. They don't get written up in the, you know, the, uh, you know, the Jerusalem Daily Times, or, you know, or whatever. They don't get, they don't get notoriety. But God uses them nonetheless. Hey, you may be used by God in a mighty way, and nobody, you know, it's never recorded in the history books. You, you may, you may never get uh, recognized. Well, you, nobody may hand you a plaque that says congratulations on a job well done. But you're going to be a part of what God is doing, and only you can do it. Now notice that they weren't they weren't responsible for casting the vision. They weren't responsible for relaying the mission uh, or the vision. They were simply responsible for completing the vision. And I, I think that, that many in the in the body of Christ, many in the church, like it's not your role to cast the vision. Or relay the vision. That's kind of kind of what God called me to do. Like God says, "Okay, here's the marching orders," and I'm supposed to tell y'all, "Okay, here's 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 where God says we're going." And then, as the body of Christ, you're the one that's going to make it happen. I'm not going to make it happen. Now, think about it. What would happen if these guys had a drug up and quit? What what would have happened? You know, if they'd have just all sat down in the desert and said, "Well, Moses did a terrible job. He didn't give us in the promised land, and and he said we was going to have a nice smooth tabernacle. We didn't have we we don't have nothing." Moses' responsibility wasn't to, to complete it. He was to say, "This is what God says we need to do," and then people got together and did it. So what's your job in the kingdom? That's, that's what we have to ask ourselves. Whatever it is that God has for you to do, that's what, that's what we have to have from you for the, the church to function the way it's supposed to. The, in Luke chapter 8, we told the story of where Jesus goes to the area of the Gadarenes and Finds this young man that's demon possessed. He asks, What's your name? And the demons respond, Legion. Because there are many of them. Well, he casts out the demons, and the man is so overwhelmed and so grateful that he begs Jesus, Let me go with you. Let, let me go. In other words, let me go, get in the boat and go back with you as one of your disciples. Let me hang out with one of, with the twelve. Let, let, me, let me follow you around all, all over Galilee, preaching and teaching. I want to be there. And it's a remarkable thing. It's a remarkable answer that Jesus gives him because you would expect him to say, well, come right along, the more the merrier. But instead he says, no, you can't come with me this time. I've got a different job for you to do. I want you to go back home and I want you to tell everybody the great things that God has done for you. As bad as, as bad as that man wanted to be one of the twelve, Jesus said, I've got a, got a different job for you to do. Now, if, if that man hadn't have done it, if, if he had just got mad and said, well, I can't be one of the twelve. I just won't. I just won't do anything. I'll just sit down there and, and do nothing. 
No problem with that whole week of this church. Who, who would have been there to tell the story? If that man hadn't have done what Jesus asked him to do, nobody in that whole region would have, would have heard the story of Jesus. There are people in your sphere of influence, in your neighborhood, your friends, your co-workers, your family, that the only person that can talk to them about Jesus is you. If you fail, if you sit down on the job, nobody, that they won't hear it from anybody. You say, oh, well, they can turn on TBN and hear Joyce Meyer. Well, we'll, we'll debate whether or not they can hear the gospel from that a different time. But the truth is, you have an influence. I can turn on the TV and I can hear somebody talking to me, saying, you need to do this, you need to do that. And I might hear them and I might not. But if my friend comes to me and says, hey, you, you, really, need, you really need to do this or think about this, that makes a difference. If my family, if my wife or my son comes to me and says, hey, Dad, hey, son, you need to do this or you need to think about this. Have you thought about this? I'm going to pay attention to that because I, I, I trust them and I believe they have my best interest at heart. You have that kind of influence with a certain number of people and that I can never reach, but you can. What shall I do? Second question we have to ask ourselves is why shall I do? Why shall I do? Why me? You know, these guys that we mentioned, Aholiab and Bezalel, they, uh, they, neither one of them were from the tribe of Levi. Once the tab now think about this, once the tabernacle is completed, they won't get to go in to, to the, they're not priests, they won't get to go in and, and, and offer offerings at the at the Ark of the Covenant. They won't even get to see it. Once it's completed, it's, it's shut behind the curtain and they'll never see it again. But yet they had the privilege to make it. A lot of the things that they're going to construct, the, the furnishings of the temple, they'll never get to see once the temple is complete, or the, the tabernacle. Interchangeably, but really, the, at this point, it's the tabernacle, not the temple. They'll never have opportunity to see that, but they're going to have the blessing of uh, of building. God has given them the special blessing of building it. We're told in chapter thirty-five that the women had a major role, and they were responsible for manufacturing a lot of the fabric that was used. Big, huge, ornate curtains and, uh, and drapes uh, in the in the tabernacle that was used to section off different areas and, and, and make room in different places in the tabernacle. Now there were there was very limited places that a woman could go in the tabernacle. She could go up to a certain point to worship, but not further. Now if she was a man, she could have gone further, but a woman wasn't allowed. To very close access into the temple, into the tabernacle. But if it wasn't for the women, there wouldn't be there wouldn't be a tabernacle because they're the one that sewed the, the curtains to make it. But God let them have a, a special a special blessing in doing that. Now, what if they had a drug? What if what if they'd have said, "Well, I don't think I'm going to try to." Be a part of doing something that I'm not going to get to see or be a part of. We're doing we're doing things right now. Our church is doing things right now that some of us won't live to see how it all plays out. I may not live to see how it all that all plays out, you know. But I get the blessing of, of being a part of it while a lot of it's going on right now, and you do too. You can't just think in terms of well, what am I going to get out of it? What you get out of it is knowing that you've been used by God. 
And I, you know, this this journey of following the Lord, you know, now I think it was like 31 years ago I started this ministry. Mm -hmm. 90, Memorial Day Sunday of 92, so that would have been 31 years ago. You know, it, it, it hasn't been an easy journey. It hasn't always been a fun journey, but I've got to see the Lord work in ways that most people never will. You can't put a, put a price tag on it. You follow God's calling on your life, whatever that is, and you'll see God work in ways most people never will. And, and you will get to be a part of it, experience God using you. He has a task specifically for you. Bezalel and, and Aholiab, they, they had a task that was specifically for them. Not for Moses, not for Aaron, for them. You'll experience blessings that no one else will have. And God has given you a task that is a blessing for you to do. If I try to go do other people's calling, I don't get a blessing. You know, I thank the Lord for people like Bob and our three VBS trips who, who make all this happen. Because honestly, I don't like to. I really don't. I did, I've done it. I, I've been a part. I was two summers. I was a youth and children intern, Second Baptist Corpus Christi. And I, you know, I figured out real quick that children's ministry is not my my cup of tea. I didn't, you know, youth ministry is one of those things. I wouldn't take a million dollars for my experience with it. I wouldn't give you two cents to get to do it again. I mean, it's kind of, you know, I I, I enjoyed youth ministry when I did youth ministry like a hundred years ago. Children's ministry, I never really enjoyed. I, I just, I don't, you know, I'd rather talk to 80-year-olds than 8-year-olds. I just, it's, I just, it's not my thing. But, but I'm thankful that we have people that that's their heart, that's their passion. For me to go do children's ministry isn't a blessing to me. But for them to do it, it is a blessing. And so, if everybody's doing their calling and everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing, then everybody gets a blessing out of the deal. You know, we're, here we are in the middle of a, of a remodel project. Um, can I tell y'all a secret? I don't know nothing about building buildings. <laughs> I know nothing about building buildings. Now, I've been in church, I've been in, I think, three, this is the third church where we've done either a building or a remodel. In one church we did like Two, two or three, you know, like we did a, re, a complete remodel and then the, the gym flooded and we had to do it all over again. And I'm like, uh. But anyway, so I got here and you can imagine how excited I was when I found out, hey, we want to build buildings and remodel buildings and we want to do all this stuff. So, so but here's what I figured out real quick. God don't want me to build buildings. He called me to preach. He didn't call me to build buildings. So I, I can't even, I'm the guy that I can't even drive a nail in a two by four without bending over. Like I'm like the most incompetent construction guy there is. I had spent one summer as a plumber's helper when I was in high school. Somebody said, did you, did you learn anything? I said, yeah, I learned I didn't want to be a plumber when I grew up. Uh, but here's the thing. We got guys that that's in there. We got guys that are skilled and gifted in that. See? And after, after we voted, you know, I, I watch guys like Steve and guys like Greg, and, and, and you can just tell it's their thing. They, they, they love it. They enjoy it. Most, most days they enjoy it. Uh, most of the time they enjoy it. And, and it's a blessing to me. And I told we the night we voted on it, you know, we had you know we had a really strong you know strong majority that all said, yeah, let's let's go for it. We believe this is God's will. Let's let's do it. Let's go for it. And you know, I come out. And I think Steve. I know Steve, and I think Greg might have been in that conversation too. They said, well, we're 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 running to the hill. We're getting out of here. I said, no, wait, you can't leave. 
I said, you're the guy that's going to make me look like I know what I'm doing. And they kind of laughed. I'm like, no, I'm serious. Because I really don't. Now, now here, I, I have a philosophy, and I, I told our staff this. This is my philosophy. I said, when we get up in front of people, these be people, when we get in front, in front of y'all, we're going to act like and look like we know what we're doing. Now, we get to staff meeting, we may close the door, we may look at one another and say, guys, we don't have a clue what we're doing. But when we get in front of the church, we're going to look like and act like we know what we're doing because here's what I found. As long as people believe that you know what you're doing, they'll follow you. Now, if people ever start to get the idea you don't know what you're doing, they're not going to follow you. And that's, that is death to a church. But we're always going to look like we know what we're doing. When it comes to building, I don't know nothing about it. I, I don't know what I'm doing. But here's what I do know. God has put people in the body of Christ, in the church, who do know what they're doing. And they make us all look like we know what we're doing. Because here's the thing. I may not know what I'm doing. You may not know what you're doing. But friends, God knows what he's doing. And God has called and gifted each of us for the task we're supposed to do. I had people come up to me, you know, from time to time say, Man, I just don't know how you do what you do. I just don't know how you stand up and, and, and talk to people. Well, my daddy was a used car salesman, so I guess I come by naturally. I don't know. You may not know how I do what I do, but I don't know how you do what you do. I don't know how people have the patience to deal with children. You know, I can't even deal with my own. I sure don't want to deal with anybody else's. I don't know how you build buildings. I just know that if I, when God says build it, and I stand up and say, hey, okay, we need to build a building, we need to remodel a building, then God has people in place to get it done. Now, if God don't have people in place to get it done, then he's probably not telling us to build buildings. Because if God tells us to do it, he puts people in there to get it done. What shall I do? Well, what's God called you to do? What is it that, that, that he's gifted you for and, and given you a passion for? And finally, the question we have to ask ourselves is, how shall I do it? How shall I do it? How am I going to accomplish this? Well, how did they do it? How did old Bezalel and Ahodiah, how did they get it done? They did it, first of all, exactly as God said to do it. God laid out the specific instructions, the specific directions, and they followed that to the T. If God has called you to something and he's told you how to do it, you do it exactly how he's told you to do it. He, he doesn't need your plans and your input. You do it like God says to do it. And notice how they did it. They're, they used only the best materials. They used, they used gold, they used silver, they used precious stones, the, the kind of thread, even down to the, the thread that they used to, to make the curtain. It was only the very best. I think it's interesting. This is, you know, fast forward, you know, 500 years or so when Solomon is building the temple. And he goes into great detail of, of the lily work on top of the capital, how they completed that. You read that and you realize nobody would even be able to see that except for God. But they painstakingly did it just like God said to do it, even though nobody could see it but God. Now, can you make the application? I don't need to make that for you, do I? How do you do the work of the Lord? God deserves your best. Don't, don't give God only half of an effort. Only half your best. Give him your best. He deserves it. And even the things that he calls you to do that no one will see except for God deserves your very best. I think it's interesting that these men had God-given ability. But it was the filling of the Holy Spirit that enabled them to do the work. In other words, Bezalel and Aholiah, 
They had ability to work with uh, jewels, to work uh, with making different um, casts of, of different metals and all of this stuff. They had some natural ability, natural talent, but it was the filling of the Holy Spirit that it enabled them to accomplish the work. You may have a talent. You may have a, an ability. But it, it's the Holy Spirit that elevates that to something God honoring and God ordained. You, you can be a really good singer and accomplish nothing for the Lord. But through the Holy Spirit, when God is in it, then suddenly that talent becomes a mighty tool in God's hand. You can be a, a great orator, a great speaker, but without the Holy Spirit, you're not going to accomplish anything. Could it be that, that even to, to do something that, that the world may look at and say that's just a menial task requires the Holy Spirit. If, if, if you're going to do something for God, you're going to have to have the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is where it moves from just a talent to a call. See? This is where it moves into something holy. I hear people use the term vocation, and they, they misuse the term all the time. They'll talk about their job, and they'll say, this is my vocation. The word vocation it actually comes from the word that means to call. So a vocation is something that God has called you to do. Now, if, if you are doing something that God has called you to do, now it's not an occupation. Now it's a vocation. So, a lot of people use the term vocation, but what they really mean is occupation. What do you do? Well, I'm a truck driver. That's my vocation. Well, has God called you to be a truck driver? Or are you... Are you is he using you in you know for king you know for the kingdom purposes by driving a truck? If, if so, that's your vocation. But if you just do it to go get a paycheck, you rumble every mile you drive, that's not a vocation. That's an occupation. Everybody, if you're gonna make a living, you have an occupation. God wants you to have more than an occupation, he wants you to have a vocation. Maybe that maybe your vocation and your occupation are the same thing. My vocation and my occupation at this stage of life is the same thing. I'm a blessed man. Maybe you, you have a, an occupation and, and then you also have a vocation. And your vocation, sometimes those two bleed together. In other words, you might think that, well, I have a job working in a factory and it's just a nine, nine to five job and they... They work me like a dog and they pay me beans and, I, and, and I, you know, I'm sick of it. And when you really start to allow God to work and move in your life, you may see that that occupation, that you're there and, and you're an influence on people and you begin to reach people that nobody else can reach. You may be reaching people that will never set foot in the doors of the church, but you can lead them to Jesus because, because of where you are and who you are. So sometimes occupation and vocation blend together. But when it, when it moves from an occupation to a vocation, when it moves from a talent to a calling, now it moves to something holy. When, when God's Spirit goes to work using your God-given ability. Now you take something that's common and ordinary and you make it something.
something holy. Verse 3 doesn't say that God gave Bezalel wisdom and understanding and knowledge. Apparently he had those things. But instead it says he gave his spirit to him. And apparently the spirit is what perfected these things. He had natural ability in working with these things. But it wasn't until God gave the spirit that the spirit perfected these things. You may have God-given ability, whatever they may be, talent, ability. You know, uh, look at our, our game stuff, they use the featuring Rubik's Cube. I learned, I learned how to solve that, like in seventh grade. Bought a book, learned how to solve it. My sister peeled the stickers off. It never worked again after that. She cheated, she cheated. Um, but... You know, that's, that's, that was a talent, it was a skill. It was a skill that nobody cares about anymore. But, it, but it, was a, it was a skill I had. But if somehow I could use that to reach young people for Jesus, then that ordinary, meaningless skill of solving a Rubik's Cube now could become something holy. I, I never used it for that, I never did that. I wish now I would, I would have, could have. The spirit will be sufficient for the job, whatever it is. So don't worry about that. I, I have, now I'm going to, I'm going to say this, and, and somebody's going to afterwards tell me how I'm wrong, and that, that's okay. You can do that. I'll listen for a little bit, and I'm going to be wrong. So I, but... <laughs> I have a problem with these spiritual gift tests. Have you seen those? Have you taken those? I just I have a problem with them. And my problem is this. They tend to only measure the gifts that you're already using. I, I, took, I took some when I was in seminary and before I got to seminary. And I don't even remember the spiritual gifts I was supposed to have. Gift of helps. I don't even know what that is. What is that? I don't, I don't even know what that is. I'm probably the most, the least helpful person you'll ever meet. So I'm, I don't know if that's that accurate at all. Um, preaching, teaching, pastor, evangelist. Evangelist. None of those. None of those made my top ten list of gifts. But what am I doing here? Obviously, I'm in the wrong spot because I don't have the gift of preaching or teaching, or pastor, or evangelist. Well, no. It's just that it's very hard to quantify that on a, on a test. I, I think there's elements of what God's called me to do that I use a little bit of all of those things. So, here, here's, here's my problem. I think it's backwards. I think people take these spiritual gift tests and, 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 they, and they look at what comes back and they use that to try to figure out what God's called me to do. I think that's totally backwards. You need to pray and seek the Lord and find out what is it that God's calling you to do. And then trust in faith that he's going to give you the gifts you need to do it, whatever that is. You may, get more, you may need more than one gift. And you may need this gift today and you may need a different gift down the road. My God is sufficient to whatever you need. The, 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 the Holy Spirit was going to give these men what they needed to build this tabernacle and the furnishings in it. They would never need that skill again. They, they weren't going in the tabernacle building business. They weren't going to open up a company, Bezalel and the Holy Isle. Tabernacles are us. They needed it one time. God gave it to them that time. He reached down and touched them for that one time and use them in a mighty way. God may reach down one time for one job and, and give you what you need and you may never need it again. But whatever he's telling you to do, he's going to give you what you need at that time. So, that's pretty much what i got tonight. Are you a behind-the-scenes guy or a behind-the-scenes gal? I mean, what job is it that God has called you to do that only you can do? 
And what blessing are you missing out on by not doing it? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and how you do speak to us through it. God, I thank you that you call each of us to a special work. Some, some of us uh, front and center and some of us behind the scenes, but everybody has a special work that you've called us to that only, only we can do. God, I pray that you would be with us now in this invitation time. Lord, speak to us. Lead us, God, to the decisions we'd have to make. We pray this in the name of Jesus.